so, you know, I have this very broad mandate from from to talk. So I first thought I would say hello. Um, you've heard a lot of that. Um, but I want to ask you a question. USA is 10,000 miles away, Russia is 10,000, you know. Here, whoops, Korea shares land borders with Russia and China. Its closest relation uh, to Japan is 50 miles by ferry. And of course, as many of you know, the United States had at one time 100,000 troops and nuclear weapons on the peninsula, and now we have 30,000 troops. So the four biggest economies, the four biggest countries in the world are literally nose to nose on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys have heard this before. This is, so here's China, Russia shares this border, here's Japan, the US is there. Uh, and we're gonna take a minute, um, and I don't know if you guys have done this yet, but uh, you know how Italy looks like a boot? What does Korea look like? If you sort of squint, what does it look like? Raise your hand, don't shout it out. Uh, in the back, yeah, a rabbit. Wow, you guys are good. Did you hear this before? You already heard this. No, did you? Okay, where, where, where is it, right? Korea looks like a bunny, right? Here's the ears. Here's the little nose. Here's some paws, and here's some paws, right? <laughs> now, the interesting thing is that uh, this is sort of traditionally, when I was growing up, this is what we said, but... What, it, what, it's, what, it's come, what it's come to be known sort of in, in international relations is like being, looking like a bunny, not that macho, right? <laughs> not manly enough. So Koreans will now tell you uh, that it looks like a tiger. <laughs> However, and this may not be politically correct, but I submit to you that is not what you would think of, you know, I mean, you really have to squeeze the tiger to get it in there, right? I mean, I think it looks more like a bunny, frankly, but... Uh, I will admit a tiger is more macho. So um, anyway, that's, that's what Korea looks like. Now, how big is Korea? In, in general, as, as, as we know, we tend to think of China and Japan as huge. And Korea is really small. So one thing that we did, uh, you can do, is you can take population and sort of land mass, the size in 1,000 square kilometers. And you put a bunch of Asian countries on there. And it looks sort of what you expect. Japan's big. 130 million people. Thailand, Philippines, South Korea, uh, 45, 50 million people. Singapore is tiny, of course. It's a little city state. 
about 4 million people. So yeah, right? There's some really big countries, there's some small countries. But in a way, that doesn't necessarily tell us that much about it. One of the interesting things we can do is what if we picked up Korea, if we picked it up and we put it in Europe, how big would it be? Because in general, we tend to think of European countries as big and you know, a lot of these Asian countries as small. So we did the same thing, population and land mass. What's interesting about this chart? Just go ahead and look at it for a minute. Hand, anybody? Go ahead. It's as big as the UK and so forth, but just from where it is on the plot, it's more densely populated than places like Spain and France. Okay, sure, right? I mean, the first thing I would say is Japan is huge, right? With 130 million people, Japan is almost twice the population of Italy, France, UK. Japan is a mons huge country if we put it in Europe. And a unified Korea would be roughly the same size as all the European countries. 75, 80 million people. And a land mass roughly the same. It's not like UK, Germany, and Italy are over here and Korea's down there. I mean, Korea's a big country if you put it in Europe. It's actually not that small. Because we're used to thinking of Germany and France and whatever as being big, right? The problem for Korea, <laughs> and frankly for Japan, is that this is a false map because this is really what East Asia looks like. <laughs> That's Japan down there. That's Thailand. Korea is the 48, right? South Korea. China is huge. China is a continent-sized country. So of course, compared to China, everybody's small. It's the same way as the United States, right? We are a continent-sized country. Right? So European countries would all be clustered around there, you know, and the US is here. But it's just to give you a sense of the scale, right? For most countries that aren't continent-sized, Korea is actually pretty normal-sized. It's not that small. Now, why also do we care? This is a chart, and, and I don't have too many charts, but I think this is very interesting. One way we compare is economic development. We all know that Korea... How many of you have a Samsung or an LG phone, TV, etc.? Hyundai car, right? Korea's had an economic miracle in many ways. It's one of the things when I teach my undergrads or my MBA class that we, f we spend time on. How did they grow so fast? But this chart is particularly vivid because it's not just are we richer than we were before, because every country is basically richer than they were before. No matter how poor they are, you know, cell phones didn't exist, and now you've got people in the poorest of countries who can actually buy a cell phone, right? So they're better off than they were. But often we want to measure, are you catching up? to the richest countries, or in, in this case, the United States. So what this does here is puts uh, uh, economic wealth per person income, GDP per capita, gross domestic product per capita, or wealth per person, as a percentage of American wealth per person. OK, so you guys got that, right? If you go back to 1950, uh, the red is Mexico and the blue is Brazil. Uh, 25, 15% is rich. So every Mexican was about 25% as rich as every American per person. You watch over uh, a generation, by the 1980s, Mexico had risen to uh, 35%. They were beginning to catch up. However, that was short lived. And so by 2005, 2004, Mexico is basically per person as rich as it was 50 years ago. So yeah, Mexicans today are richer than they were yesterday. Brazilians were at 15%, now they're at 20%, right? But they're not really closing the gap in terms of wealth compared to the United States. The United States is getting richer just as they're getting richer. And sadly, this is the case for most countries around the world outside of Europe. Africa, Latin America, Middle East, many South Asian countries. So why are Korea, Taiwan, these kind of countries so interesting? They started out, green is Taiwan, yellow is Korea. They started out at 10% as rich, one-tenth as rich per person as America in 1950. But rather than a sort of up and down thing, it's almost a direct line upwards. So that by 2004, they're over 50% as rich as the United States. And they've continued to close the gap. These numbers just haven't been updated. So these are countries that have truly 
close the gap compared to the United States in terms of economic development. And you can see that if you ever go to Seoul, if you, anyone goes to Korea, Japan, Taiwan, these countries in many ways are more sophisticated, <laughs> more technologically intense than um, uh, American countries. Yes? No, this is just South Korea. We'll talk, we're going to talk about North Korea later because North Korea has not closed the gap. <laughs> but the South Korean economy, right? So we have uh, the world's largest shipbuilder is Hyundai, or, or South Korea and Hyundai Heavy Industries, right? Um, Samsung and, and LG are now global brands. So in many ways, uh, we know South Korean companies. They've managed to transform themselves in ways. And that's so one reason, even if you don't have Korean students or direct in, in, uh, interactions with Koreans, why it's an interesting story. Because this is truly amazing, what the, South, uh, what the East Asian countries have done, particularly South Korea and Taiwan. How did they do this? How did they catch up and nobody else caught up? I'm not going to answer it here. We're going to move onwards. But I'd be happy to talk about it as, as, as we go, right? So just in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to try and finish with enough time that we can talk about whatever you guys want. Uh, but I'm, I, you know, this is just some reasons why we think Korea is interesting, why we might want to study it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk now about uh, uh, pre-modern Korean history a little bit. And I'm going to leave you with, uh, I want to start with a question, which I don't expect you to be able to answer. Uh, but how many times did Japan and China invade Korea? Does anybody know? I mean, I just heard Mary mentioning it before, so I think it gave away a little bit. But does, I don't expect you to. I didn't know before I started doing this research. Does it, you don't have to give me a number, but does anybody think they could, they could come up with an answer? <laughs> you guys are too well trained. <laughs> this will not be on the test. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the popular perception is that Korea has just been constantly invaded. We're the small country, the big countries do whatever they want. Uh, and I'm going to give you a different story, actually, and one that, one that shows a lot more stability in East Asia which for those of you who do uh, world history or, or whatever else, is actually, I think, one of the most interesting things about East Asian history is how it actually worked, right? Because if we go to Europe, and we all know this, right? The history of Europe is a blood-soaked series of unending wars against each other. From the Hundred Years' War, the Seven Years' War, the, uh, you know, just on and on and on, right? Uh, Napoleon, Trafalgar, etc. In Europe, you had a bunch of similarly sized states, kingdoms, whatever, that spent centuries beating the uh, stuffing out of each other. Uh, and the best way to show this is if you put a map. So this is, this is Europe in 1300. And we have a whole bunch of political units here that don't exist anymore, right? So there's a King Crown of Castile or Genoa and Savoy, Duchy of Guienne, whatever, right? Uh, a whole bunch of political units. And in fact, the, the Europe that we know today really didn't even begin to come into focus until the 19th century. So Europe by 1800 is beginning to look like Spain and Portugal, but you still have Sardinia, you still have Naples, the Kingdom of Naples, Torino, Helvetic Republic, the Ottoman Empire. So borders in Europe changed constantly as kingdoms rose and fell and people conquered each other and moved back and forth. The Europe that we know today is actually really recent. Now, in contrast, in, in, in East Asia, the four main states of East Asia, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and China, have basically existed for well over 1,000 years. Their borders changed a little bit, but these are identifiably the same units. And so Korea became Korea around the 7th century. Now, there's a lot of historical uh, 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 debate over this this kingdom called Goguryeo. But essentially, there were three kingdoms on the Korean peninsula. Before then, the uh, Baekje, Shilla, and Goguryeo, this Kaya was a, was a smaller thing. Uh, before then, around 200 AD, there were a bunch of little tribes, things back and forth. These kingdoms developed around 200, so that by 600 AD, you had basically three large kingdoms. Yamato, Japan, the Japanese state that we know today, it roughly traces its emergence to around the 6th or 7th century. Before then, again, just a bunch of little tribes or something. And, but there we can trace a political heritage. 
Now, the interesting thing is that here, there was a world war. There was a world war, meaning everybody who could be involved was involved. Uh, oops, right? So the Japanese allied with Baekje, Shilla allied with Tang China, uh, Shilla and Tang crushed Goguryeo. Uh, they then beat up Baekje, and the Japanese sent some troops. They sent them home. So there was a massive war, a couple decades. And when the dust settled, you basically had the, the beginnings of a unified Korean political unit, which covered two thirds of the peninsula around 700 AD. And that political unit basically sort of pushed northwards so that by the 10th century, the border with China was this thing called the Yalu River. So you still have unified Shilla, uh, and it sort of pushed northwards. By the Choson dynasty of, 13, of 1400, they had basically filled out to what it looks like today. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit. Because this region up here, as you may or may not know, the Manchurian region is basically wilderness. It's really cold. It's desolate. It's big mountains. It's, nobody really lives there. So the border that did get demarcated by 1000 AD was the Yalu River. This was the most important border because this is where people from Korea went over to China to trade, and they went back and forth. Up here is just a bunch of wilderness. And over the centuries, the frontier began to turn more and more into a border. So now there's the, the Yalu and the Tumen Rivers. And this right here is, again, wilderness mountains. And that was, that was settled and demarcated between China and Korea in the 18th century, 1711. Now, why, why is this interesting? Literally 1,000 years, this river has been the border between China and Korea. That's an astonishing amount of stability between two recognizably political units that exist today. The same thing actually in Vietnam. Vietnam and China, proto-Vietnam at the time, demarcated a border with China at Lan Song. In 1999, when they did the formal modern treaty with the board, it's this exact same place that it had been since basically the 10th century. That's an astonishing amount of stability between political units. They expanded in other directions, into frontiers, but between these political units, an enormous amount of stability. These are deeply, deeply uh, long-lived kingdoms with a sense of who they are and a sense of difference from, from someone else. All right, whoops. So, so how is this actually different from East Asia? In some ways, this is, this is what we call the tribute system, right? There was a set of ideas out there that are very different from modern sense of how you do international relations. I mean, the best example of it is uh, that woven through our ideas of international relations, and domestic politics is the idea of equality, right? This is a this is a Enlightenment notion, French Enlightenment notion from the 17th century. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. What's that from? <laughs> no, right? Um, it's also from, of course, the way that we think about international relations. Once you are a nation state, and you're granted diplomatic recognition, and you send ambassadors, everybody's the same. So the United States is formally the same as a tiny country like Bolivia. And that's not to criticize Bolivia, but Bolivia is two million people. On nothing are they the same in terms of size, power, wealth, anything. Two million people, 300 million people, right? We've got nuclear weapons, they don't. They're not the same at all, except we're called nation states. So this idea of equality is deeply woven through international relations, and in terms of our domestic politics. But as, as uh, I heard briefly mentioned before, East Asia has a very different historical sense of international relations and what we would call as hierarchic, not equality, which sort of intuitively it wouldn't be. Why, why would you think that they're the same? They're not the same, <laughs> but rather a rank order. And the interesting thing is that in Europe, you had an idea of equality, formal equality, 
informal inequality, because of course there were some countries were bigger, more powerful than others, and endless fighting. And in East Asia, you had formal hierarchy, formal ranking of countries. Informally, the big countries, China, left everybody alone. They didn't really interfere in South Korean or Korean domestic politics at all. So informal equality uh, and centuries of stability. And there were sort of two basic norms or practices. Uh, one is called investiture. Uh, and then the other was just cultural learning. And investiture was basically going through the motions of going to the Chinese emperor and saying, do you approve of me being king? So you send some, so you send some diplomats to China. The emperor says, of course you're going to be king. Here's a bunch of gifts. You go home. And the Chinese emperor leaves you alone. Right? Formally, you're saying, yeah, you're, you're an emperor. I'm only a king. But informally, the Chinese didn't care. They just wanted to make sure you understood where the rank order was. Also informally, of course, China at the time was the center of civilization and learning throughout that region. So in many very interesting ways, Koreans were happy to copy. So, um, and I, I have to remind my students that this actually isn't a real photo taken from the 12th century, um, <laughs> right? Uh, but language, up until the invention of the Korean alphabet, and even to this day, Koreans used Chinese characters to write. It was a sign of education, in fact, right? Even if you learned the Korean indigenous way of writing, which is much easier, precisely because it was a local indigenous way of writing, it was considered more educated and more sophisticated to be able to write in Chinese characters. And everybody around the region used them. Uh, does anybody know what this Chinese character is? Hmm? Yeah, uh, in English, though. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Right? I don't know why. I was looking through the web just, right? Because everybody used the same characters, essentially. Right? Uh, there's an examination system. The best way to move up, again, this is very Confucian. Education was the most important thing. Being a rich uh, 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 trader was not. But everybody wanted to be a student of the Confucian classics and get into the government service by passing the civil service exam. It was the only method for social mobility in Korea that, that was introduced. It's actually, I saw that downstairs. It was introduced roughly in the ninth century. And that was the way that everybody got to be successful. And it's one of the historical roots for why education is so important in Korea today. For centuries, that was the way to success. Being a trader wasn't. Being a general was not. There used to be a military exam along with the civil service exam. But it fell into disuse because the military wasn't being used a lot. They even copied the organization of government. There were six ministries. There was the, the king, and there were six ministries in China. And there was Koreans who had the six ministries, identical. Vietnam had the same six ministries. Board of Rights, Board of Punishments, etc. They wore the same insignia. The only difference is Korean insignia started at rank three. One is the highest. So the Chinese had one, two, three, four, whatever. The Koreans started at three. The highest rank you could get in Korea is three. Because they weren't going to be the Chinese, but they were using the same kind of a thing. Right? Now, what, what makes this so interesting is like, so, you know, so there, there's a set of ideas out there. There's a set of goals. As long as everybody knows where they fit, everything's fine. And a lot of cultural buying from Korea. Uh, from China. Now, there's indigenous Korean culture as well. Don't get me wrong. There's a deeply indigenous Korean culture, which is not Confucian, which is not hierarchic, which is earthy, egalitarian, and whatever else. And we're going to come back to this. So it wasn't a wholesale copying of Chinese culture any more than, for example, Mexico or Europe is borrowing wholesale from American culture. We're number one today, and people sort of like to borrow some stuff. Everyone wants to learn English. But that doesn't mean they all want to become American and act all like us. But the interesting thing about this, and, and, and I heard it again mentioned, is this war. Because this is the exception that in some ways proves the rule. In 1592, in the Imjin this Japanese general Hideyoshi decided he was going to invade China. And to get there, he had to go through Korea. So what did he do? He invaded, at one point, it was almost 200,000 soldiers. They crossed, the, they crossed these 50 miles of water on 700 ships uh, and invaded Korea. Korea defended with 60,000 troops. Lee Sun Shin had turtle boats. 
mercilessly cut their supply lines. Uh, and the Chinese ultimately sent, at first they didn't believe the Koreans. Like, you're kidding me. The Japanese are invading us? <laughs> but eventually they sent troops and, and helped defend Korea. That was a world war also at the time. Now, what's interesting about this is about the same time, 1588, in Europe, there was the Spanish Armada. You guys have heard of that, right? The Spanish Armada has been called, let me make sure I get this right, right? The greatest military force ever assembled in Renaissance Europe when the Spanish tried to invade England. And they invaded with about 30,000 troops, and they were defeated by about 20,000 English troops. The point is, the war in, in East Asia was about five to 10 times the scale that, that Europe could even imagine creating. And now this is really interesting, because not only did this war dwarf the scale of, of European wars. I mean, when, when these guys decide to fight, they could do it on a scale you could not imagine in Europe. They had the logistical, military, organizational capacity to get together hundreds of thousands of soldiers. So when they decided to fight, they could really fight. And yet, in some ways, this is the only war between the three of these for about 12 centuries. There was that world war I told you about at the beginning, you know, in, in Kogryo, when, there was, when we ended up with uh, the sort of unified Korea. And then you get to 1894, 1870, depending on when you want to call, when the Japanese and Chinese began fighting again. And in between, there's only one war. But they clearly could do it. It's not that they couldn't take 100,000 guys and go across water. And so the question must be, why didn't they fight? Or, and that's what I get to, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot more to, in my book. Why didn't they fight more? But also just the mere fact that there weren't that much more fighting is, is worth noting, especially when we start to compare it to Europe and the incessant invasions between France and Europe. At that time, I actually counted up between 1300 and uh, 1900, there were 43 times that France and England were involved in wars. <laughs> right? uh, so this is, this is actually quite interesting, right? So why? These are old, powerful, organized countries. These aren't just a bunch of scattered tribesmen walking around not fighting with each other. And that's, in many ways, a fascinating type of uh, uh, question. Yes? But weren't there lots of invasions like, between China and Korea, and then like, Japan invading the pirates on like, mainland China? I mean, there was a lot of... Well, that's, there's, there's a difference, right, um, between pirate invasions, which aren't military, right? What are, what are the pirates normally? I mean, this is actually interesting. Wegu is, is the title for it, right? Wegu is a, or is that, woku, I guess, is the Japanese word. These were small, they're not pirates like pirates of the uh, Caribbean, right? One guy on a boat. Uh, usually it's a family. Half traders, when uh, trade was difficult, then they would turn to piracy. So absolutely, they could, they could be consequential, right? What would usually happen is it's a raid on a town or something like that, and, and, and then somebody leaves. That's very similar to the border wars that America fought for a long time on its borders. Why, why we created the uh, uh, USS Constitution, right, was to go fight the Barbary Coast pirates, you know, the marine thing, right, from the halls of, da da da, you know, <laughs> to the shores of Tripoli, right? So yes, they're consequential. But we tend to think of wars being government organized, hundreds of thousands of troops. And the pirates, were they were always a nuisance, the same way they're a nuisance now. But we don't think of the Somali pirates right now as being wars either, right? So yeah, and there, there's another point that I make. I mean, I could talk about history the whole time because partly what we're doing then and partly what we're doing now, my one sentence history of the world, we have enough time for this, right? Um, actually, let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this right here. For anybody, what's the difference between a frontier and a border? A border is defined? Uh-huh. Absolutely, right? A border is a line, and a frontier is a space, where sort of we have political control here, it peters out, uh, then there's some anarchy, and over there somewhere, there's, you, know, you begin to get political control. And a border is very clear. It's like, I stop here, you start there. My one-sentence history of the world, not to insult the history teachers, process of turning frontiers into borders. We're trying to do that today. 
in California. We're trying to draw a line that doesn't, the social and cultural ecology of Mexico and California is like this. But we are trying to create a line that goes like this. That's pirates, smugglers, drug dealers, immigrants, etc. right? And we tend to think of that as different than, than the organization of an attempt to conquer the political uh, unit on the other side, right? where we're going to mobilize an army and send it over to wipe out the other country. And so this is what's interesting. When we talk about these major mobilizations, we have very few. In the interest of time, let me just keep going on, right? Because that all ended in the 20th century. These centuries of stability disappeared with the arrival of the West and the transformation of East Asia, which had been a very stable international system with extensive trade, with militaries, I mean, uh, you know, with countries, trading, diplomats, whatever else. But it was done one way. And then almost overnight, within the space of a generation, the arrival of the West, uh, the beginning of sort of semi-imperialism, colonization of China, and the colonization of everybody else changed all of East Asia. And so the 20th century is what I'm going to spend the next half hour or so, and then we can talk about whatever you want, right? Which is, for centuries of stability, you see that in the 20th century in, in Korea and East Asia, extraordinary tumult. Just astonishing amount of change. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple. Japanese imperialism, national division, war, democracy. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about North Korea, because I think... In many ways, I could spend all day talking about North Korea, I'm sure, right? But here's Korea in 1905. This is the uh, King's Palace. This is called Kwang Kwang Moon. It's the main gate to go. How many of you guys have been to Korea? Oh, OK, good number of you. OK. Uh, have you seen this palace? I mean, this gate? They're fixing it up right now. They're restoring it, right? Um, but this was the main road. The King's Palace is right behind here. Uh, it's got good feng shui because there's a mountain in the back. South-facing, water, there's a river right here, Chung Chung, right? Oh, um, sort of the alignment, the geographic alignment of the, of the energy, you know, of the energy of the world. Yeah. I should not have said that because I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Other than that, I don't know anything about feng shui. Or in Korean, they call it pung su. Well, this was Korea, right? And a bunch of indigenous Koreans running around, right? This, this looks like Korea. Well, in 1905, and then formally in 1910, uh, Japan colonized Korea. They formally took it over and annexed it so that Korea no longer existed. Now, you're going to hear a lot about this, I think, both in, in these classes or if you read about Korea. So I'm not going to say a whole lot here other than to say from 1910 to 1945 is, is a period that m many Koreans remember or learn about as being extraordinarily harsh. The Japanese came in. There was repression. Over time, they were forced to learn Japanese and were, were forced to not use their own Korean names. You had to choose a Japanese name. Uh, my father was born at that time, so he's fluent in Japanese. Right? And they all took, when they took Japanese names, he said they all tried to use ones that were sort of similar to the Korean name. Right? So a lot of internal resistance, but it was a very, very difficult time. And obviously for Koreans, who had been a strong, proud country, proud of their accomplishments, for literally unified since the 6th century AD is extraordinarily humiliating. And the best example I can give that to you, if this is the, the, the king's palace, and what the Japanese did, in the center of that palace is build their administrative building right over the top. So here's that same picture. This is the only one I could find. Had I known better, I would have taken pictures when I was there, right? So here is that same Kwang Hwa Mun. And here is the Japanese Imperial Administration building. There can't be a more uh, insulting thing that you do than to put down your building right in front. Even more than that, if you look at it from the top, and I wasn't able to find a picture of this, if you looked at that building from the top, it was written in the Japanese character of uh, sun for Japan. So the building is built as sort of like a, uh, uh, the Japanese character for, for Japan. Extraordinarily humiliating, you can imagine, right? If there was, and again, the example, of course, if in DC in front of the Washington Monument, the Soviets built a big uh, onion dome thing, right? It'd be... Now, the reason that uh, many of you can't see it today is finally, uh, a couple of years ago, they decided to tear down this building. 
uh, and they're, they're re restoring the, the, the palace to what it looked like before. Right? So here's another view from the other side of what that, of what that palace looked like, and here's the, of the building. Right? So it was an extraordinarily difficult time for Koreans. Many came to uh, either China or the United States. Some tried to fight guerrilla. You know, off in the, in the wilderness of Manchuria, they tried to fight. Here at USC, we have one of the famous Korean uh, independence activists. We have the house that his family lived in, An Chang Ho. He wrote the Korean national anthem, Dong He Ba Ba, right? Uh, but he was living here in LA for 20 years as he went to try and fight for independence. So it was a very difficult time. Well, after that, you get independence in 1945, but immediate division of the peninsula into north and south. Right? It was decided in around 1943 by the US and the Soviet Union at the, uh, uh, I think, Malta conference. Stalin and, and Roosevelt are sitting around with um, uh, Churchill, and they say, what are we going to do? Let's divide up Germany to, to make sure that Germany doesn't fight again. Let's divide up the Korean Peninsula. You take the northern half, Soviets. I'll take the southern half. We'll, we'll um, uh, demobilize the Japanese troops. Now, the interesting thing about this is, and I'll, I'll just briefly talk about this, is this has never all made, made that much sense to me. I mean, I, do, I understand why. The Americans did not want to let the Soviets have the entire peninsula because it's geopolitically important. Why the Soviets agreed to, the, to a division is sort of surprising. But even beyond that, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. We divided up Germany because they started a war. So why didn't we divide up Japan? <laughs> right? Why did we divide up Korea and not Japan? The Japanese and Russians had even fought a war in 1904 over the islands. They still dispute to this day the northern territories. Why didn't you divide sort of Soviets get Tokyo and the Americans get Kyoto or something like that, right? The world would be totally different. Actually, probably all of the Korean Peninsula would be communist. But, you know, it's interesting to think. Why, did you, why do we not divide up Japan? What would the world look like if we had not divided up Korea? And it was totally imposed from the outside. That being said, it was divided, the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, the war, the Korean War, destroyed about 75% of all productive capacity on Korean Peninsula. As you know, the North Koreans invaded, all went all the way down to a tiny foothold at Pusan. Then the Americans outflanked them. We went all the way up to the Yalu River. Then the Chinese intervened, and we went all the way back down again. And eventually, the war stabilized exactly where it started, in the 38th parallel. The American Air Force ran out of targets to bomb in North Korea. There was nothing left to bomb. And this is Seoul, which changed hands three times. Now, in some ways, horrific tragedy. Everybody who's Korean has a memory of the Korean War, lost a friend, lost a, a, a brother, or their family is divided. Somebody's in the North, somebody's in the South. About 2 million Koreans died, 10% of the population at the time. Right. So everybody has a story. Now, there's a lot of tragedies in the world, right? So I'm not going to say this is bigger or worse than <laughs> Soviets losing 20 million in, in World War II. But it is a horrific tragedy to Koreans. The tragedy today is, and I'll talk about this when I talk about North Korea, we are exactly in the same place we were in, as we were in 1953. There has been almost zero change in North-South relations, U.S., whatever, right? We have still a divided peninsula, Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. Except North Korea now has a couple nukes. It's the only difference. Right? Nothing has changed basically in 60 years. Seoul, on the other hand, the, the benefit, and again, I would never, I would never uh, give this as a policy prescription, have a horrible, horrific war that wipes out 10% of your population because then you'll get to rebuild. But in fact, you did get a chance to rebuild. And what South Korea was able to do, this is the Han River, this is Seoul, and after the Korean War, basically everybody got to start over in 1950. So not just with infrastructure. Here's the here's the uh, uh, with the gate again. Here's 1980. You can see there's the, uh, uh, the the mountains around Seoul, some buildings, and here we are today. Right? You can't even see somewhere over there is uh, you know downtown. Right? Un unrecognizable from what it was like in 1950 or 1900. So this is, this is the benefit. Like I, again, I'm not going to suggest countries do this. But they got a chance to start over. And it wasn't just physical. Social classes got screwed up. Everything was up for grabs. 
So there was no ruling class peasants, etc. I mean, there were, but with the war and colonization and division, basically everybody got a chance to start over. So enormous transition, right? Now, during the Cold War, there were a whole bunch of military governments, coups d'etat. Uh, and in fact, no leader between 1948 and 1987. So for almost 40 years, no South Korean leader had voluntarily left office. They had all either been kicked out, assassinated, or, uh, uh, or you know, exiled. Uh, so in 19, here's the same famous Kwang Hwamun Gate. Right? Military law, there was one dictator who ruled, uh, you know, then he got killed by his own CIA guy and another one took over in 1979, killed about 2,000 citizens, between 500 and 2,000 of his own citizens to keep power. Right? We remember Tiananmen, we don't remember uh, 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 Guangzhou because Tiananmen's bad Chinese and Guangzhou was our ally, so we sort of ignored it. These were brutal repressive governments. By 1980s, though, by the 1980s, uh, here's the Kwangju protest, people taking over, right? By the 1980s, there had been enough economic development and sort of the world is changing in different ways that South Koreans and millions began to enter the streets. And we had a, a, a very dramatic democratic transition in 1987 when the president at the time decided not to call out the troops and he left office voluntarily. And since then, for the next, last 24 years, we've had um, uh, here, here are democracy demonstrations in 1987. And here's one thing about Koreans, which I, which I will point out, right? Uh, this is the other side. This is not a sort of we're, you know, you're the king, we're the peasants, you can do whatever you want. When Koreans aren't happy with something, they let you know. <laughs> which, is, which is really interesting, right? There is a deeply... I'm not going to call it democratic, but egalitarian strand in Korean society, which says, I'm as good as anybody, and it's my right to tell you what to do. And they didn't like what the government was doing, and uh, now we have democracy today. <laughs> Stable, <laughs> placid. <laughs> it is interesting, right? I mean. Uh, it's, still, it's still evolving, and, and, and it, is fun. it is fun to do this because they, they literally s spray each other with fire hoses and, and beat each other up and stuff. At the same time, it's a young democracy, and we, we had, we had um, in the United States, 200 years ago, we had, um, what do you call it, duels, right? We, it took us a long time to get to where we are today, where even though we hate it, actually, I'm not sure, I think we're going backwards right now. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I was going to say, even though you may hate the other guy, you're like, my respected senator from Nebraska or whatever, right? I mean, think we're... But it is a democracy. There have been peaceful transfers of power despite this. There's no worry that the military is going to come out. I mean, Korea has a lot of things to be proud of. The economic development, this transition to <laughs> democracy. I should put another picture on. But, like, people vote, right? There is a a movement towards better freedom of press, freedom of speech, things like that, right? There's a lot of, a lot of stuff. If you, and again, if you go to Korea in 1910 or 1950, you would not bet on this country having done this. There's no way, if you looked at Korea in 1950, you'd say, that's a country that's going to be an economic miracle that everybody's going to know about around the world and is going to be a stable democracy, right? So in many ways, this is really interesting how Korea has gone. The 20th century was extraordinarily tumultuous for Korea. Colonization, division, war, military coups d'etat, up until the 19, late 1980s, millions of people in the street protesting for democracy. So that, that, that transition, though, Korea has managed the transition to modernity quite well, given the kinds of uh, uh, things it had on its plate, so to speak. Um, roughly now, let me talk about North Korea. And I'm only going to I'll make two points. I really only have one point, and then, and then we have plenty of time to talk about whatever you want. And my, my one point is basically this. And I wonder, do I have it up here? No, I don't. OK. Um, my point is this, right? 22, 24 million, hu million human beings. It's true, I did get quoted occasionally uh, a couple weeks ago. The thing that I found most disturbing about the death of Kim Jong-il, uh, about the way that we in America responded to it, is this roar, a roar of 
every person who had like ever eaten Korean food was like an authority giving, you know, giving an interview or blogging or something like that, right? Or had been to Seoul, had been to the airport. It was astonishing how many people were like instant experts on North Korea. Not only that, if they, if they had something good to say, it would be true. But the way that we view North Koreans, everybody was doing this. There was the few voices of reason totally drowned out by the morons who were talking about they're brainwashed, they're robots, they're idiots, they're crazy, right? And we tend to forget the one thing I want you to take away, if you take away anything from today's talk, it would be actually this, which is there are 22 million human beings up there, and they think they're normal. They don't think they're weird and crazy and stuff like that. So I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit, because it is very easy for us to just do this. <laughs> Now, granted, The Economist is very funny. I give them credit. I love this, you know. This is, who's this? Kim Jong-il. He just died. And by the way, he, had, he was inconsiderate in death as in life. He died right before Christmas. Like, come on. <laughs> he ruined my Christmas. Um, right? But yeah, it's easy to, to laugh at this guy. He's sort of pudgy. He looks weird, right? This was taken at, at, in 2000, the first time that the South and North Korean leaders had ever met. They got together, they had a summit meeting. And to their credit, the reason they're saying this is because people were surprised that he could actually speak normally, you know, that he wasn't foaming at the mouth and stuff like that, right? And he was. He could speak very, very smoothly. And in fact, he showed a lot of respect to the South Korean leader who was older than him. South Korea is very hierarchic, a very Confucian thing. The, the South Korean leader is 20 years older than him. He used the right types of words that you would use to someone who is 20 years older than you. Right? He wasn't trying to speak as an equal or anything else, right? So anyway, yeah, greetings, earthlings. <laughs> Take me to your leader. Um, but this is the way that we tend to think about North Korea, right? But in many ways, North Korea is more Korean than South Koreans. I mean, South Koreans, in doing all the cool stuff they've done, globalization, economic development, democracy, right? You go to Seoul today, it's a global city. People's values have changed. They're sort of Korean, you know, but they're, they're global people now, right? North Korea, in some ways, is stuck in a time warp. It's the same way they've been doing things for 100 years. Most of these pictures are taken by uh, Russian tourists, um, although, again, we have a lot more access to North Korea now than we ever had before. So they're still using, you know, uh, cows and stuff like this. This is my favorite picture, and I almost fell over when I saw that picture a couple years ago, because this... Does anybody know what this is, basically? Yeah, ice skates, right? When you don't have uh, ice skates, you take a block of wood and two sticks. The rivers freeze over. It's way north up there, right? Uh, anybody from New Hampshire? It's worse than that. No. Right? Um, you take a block of wood and two sticks, and you, and you go around, right? So they're sort of proto-ice skates. Now, the amazing thing, my father was born in the 1930s. Uh, he also was born in northern Korea. He, they came south as refugees uh, right before the war. And when I saw that, the reason I almost fell over is my father, when I was growing up, he would tell me stories about him growing up. And he said, back in the 30s, we used to take a block of wood and two sticks. Right? And he actually even drew me a picture of it. And when I saw this, I was like, nothing has changed. Literally nothing has changed. And I actually found the picture that he drew. I went home and looked at it, right? So this is them. Right? This is the rice paddies, actually. I, I, I found it. It was in a box at home last year, and I found it, right? One interesting thing, North Koreans were the first to adopt Christianity. They were the ones, it was much more receptive in the northern part of Korea than the south in the early 20th century. Interestingly enough, Billy Graham and now his son have been regularly preaching in North Korea since the 1980s. Because Kim Il-sung's father, a uh, mother, was one of the first people to become Christian in, again, 1910s or something like that. So he always had a pretty warm spot in his heart for the American missionaries who, had, who, who we had grown up with. Right? Obviously, it's not freedom of religion right now. But, you know, and the point, the point that I make is that they think they're normal. And what I mean by that is it's very easy for us to exoticize them, to, to put a bunch of caricatures on them, right? They all walk around, they're all brainwashed, they're all walking around like automatons, right? But you look at these little kids, Gyopda, they're very cute, right? Um, this is where they're growing up. This is their home. This is their family. 
is where they went to school, right? They're like anybody else, where they have to get along, they have to live, they have to survive, but you know, they wake up in the morning, they worry about their baby, they go to work, fight with your wife. <laughs> she doesn't look that happy, right? But uh, you know, like it's, it actually, if you start to think from the perspective, not maybe of the elite, the elite is one thing, maybe half a million, a million people who are truly in the ruling elite. But the rest of the people, even if you have a middle class job, you're a teacher or you're a farmer, you just grow up. And this is where you had your first crush. I like this picture, why? You never see a North Korean soldier smiling, right? But I'll bet they actually make jokes once in a while. And the interesting thing, we have a postdoc at USC who's actually interviewed extensive anthropologist, extensively interviewed about 36 North Korean refugees. Open-ended questions, days long, getting to know them. What was your hometown like? You know, not what was the famine, what do you think about Kim Jong-il, but letting it come from them. The interesting thing she says is, they know that there's a difference here, and there are things they don't like. The best example she gives is, uh, you know, but you've got you've to eat, you've got to have a job. There's a, a Korean word for uh, 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 the black market, which was essentially illegal up until a couple of years ago, when you could do p private trading. And then there's the state-run baekwajeon, the, the, the state-owned um, store, super, uh, supermarket. But of course, you go to the state-owned supermarket, you can't buy anything. There's nothing in there, right? On the walls, there's a couple you know, really nice things, but you can't buy anything. And so when they would go to the black market, because that's the only place you could get things, they wouldn't say, I'm going to the black market. They would say, I'm going to the supermarket, and I'm going to the Bekwajom. And everybody knew what they meant. Everybody knew it was a sort of sly reference to the failings of the government. But it's a way in which people negotiate the reality of their lives versus what they can do about it, and the ways that they can, they can set meanings for themselves that help them understand, okay, I get it, this doesn't work, this does. Right? Um, these are kids on the east coast of North Korea. Uh, right? Like kids anywhere, when somebody shows up to take a photo, they all go running over. These are kids too young to even remember the famine of the mid-1990s. And the vast majority of North Koreans are like that, the same way here. I may not like what the government's doing, but there's very little that I can do about it, even in America where I can vote, right? Or frankly, our state government, which seems to be even more uh, uh, uneven, right? So what do you do? You go along and get along. Some would leave if they could. Probably others will stay. But we forget that they're actually human beings. Are things changing? A little bit. Who's that? <laughs> yeah, right, you already saw it, right? But, uh, so this is interesting. Everyone has to wear a, a lapel pin of Kim Il-sung, the, the former great leader. So here's the schoolboy wearing a lapel pin with an Adidas knockoff hat. And of course, here we have a cocoa crevinated drink. <laughs> <laughs> Yongjin, right? I mean, there are things that are changing, some more slowly than others. But to view North Korea as an unchanging, everybody thinks the same way, is an enormous mistake. And it only makes it harder for us to have appropriate policies towards North Korea. Now, who is this? You guys all know this, right? This is the, this is the third son, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Pardon? Well, this is the thing. So the joke was, the joke, because we had no pictures. To this day, we don't know how old he is. We know he's below 30 years old, right? That's how little we know about him. And up, up until last year, we had no photos of him at all. So he was anointed last year, and he started to show up. He's 28, 29 years old. So the joke that went around, sort of a grim joke, but the joke that went around after we finally saw pictures of him is, uh, now we know where all the food aid went. <laughs> <laughs> because he is, he clearly is not hungry, um, right? So, you know, uh, I'll conclude my, 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 my point about North Korea just by saying that 
it is easy to forget that there's people up there because they don't want you to think there's people up there, first of all. And nothing has changed. We are basically in exactly the same position we were in 1953. We are in what I call a new Cold War. We tried engagement for a little bit. For whatever reasons, we decided not to. So what do we do now? North and South Korea view each other as the main enemy. We do muscle flexing and name calling and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, the same kind of thing. We have, no, we have no intention really of changing. They have no intention really of changing. And we're in the same place. And it's not clear. I mean, something may change with this new guy. But it's not at all clear. I mean, they, people like to, the favorite parlor game is will they survive, will they not, will they collapse? You know? They've survived far longer than anyone else expected. They could collapse tomorrow. But my feeling is if they didn't collapse in the mid-1990s with a horrific famine that killed maybe a million people uh, with intense US pressure, they're better off than they were 15 years ago in that sense. So I, I don't think anything uh, will change very anytime soon. But you never know. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about them. Let me just conclude very briefly, and then we can talk about whatever you want. right? So, so why is Korea interesting? I think there's a number of reasons beyond the fact that I happen to be Korean American and I care. First of all, North Korea remains a major international security problem for the entire region and for the United States. If North Korea was gone, the whole region would look different if that was not a problem. Obviously, the economic success and democracy in South Korea. As for your students, they're here to stay. <laughs> They're not moving back. I mean, someone may, but I mean, there are, what, two, three, four million Korean Americans in America. And they're going to be here. Right? Uh, and Koreans are very proud, passionate people. Not emotional, just passionate. Um, so thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate it. If you think this message is important and should be viewed by others, please share it. Share it to Facebook, share it to Twitter, also be sure to like and favorite the video. By doing so, it will rise in listings and will have the opportunity to be viewed by others. Help us get the message out to the national and international stage. And also please subscribe to this channel, The Truth is Full of Lies.